Welcome back, vocational nursing students. Today we're going to talk about antihistamines, decongestants, antitussives, and expectorants. Oh my! This will be five audio lectures, two antihistamine, and then the other three categories. So let's get started. We couldn't have this conversation without first talking about the common cold. Why do we talk about the common cold? Because the general uses of these drugs is typically the common cold or nasal congestion caused by that or hay fever or respiratory allergies. And when we look at the common cold, we know that it's most often caused by a viral infection. Primarily, that's going to be the rhinoviruses, the adenoviruses, there are other viruses that can cause it, but the symptoms are pretty nonspecific. And the virus invades the tissues, the mucosa of the upper respiratory tract. And that's what causes this upper respiratory infection. You'll probably remember that the respiratory system has those upper air passage structures, including the nasal passages, the paranasal sinuses, the pharynx and the larynx, and then the lower air passages. That's the trachea, the bronchi, and the lungs. And the air then is moved through that upper passage. That's termed the conducting portion. And then it goes into the lungs or the respiratory portion where the gas exchange occurs in the alveoli. But the entire airway is lined with that epithelial tissue, and that contains glands and surface goblet cells that synthesize and secrete a very thick mucus. So when we have these viral uh, infections that occur, we get an overproduction of that mucus. Now I just want to point out this little picture over here in the corner. This is a common cold virus. Now I have a little note over here about where this picture came from. This came from technologynetworks.com. I just want to say the common cold, as we think of it, is a terrible thing. However, if you were to go and read this article, you will find that they are using a strain of the common cold virus to attack and destroy bladder cancer cells. It's being really successful. So I'm pretty excited about that. Now, let's get back to the common cold. What are some of the risk factors for the common cold? Well, age, children younger than six are at the greatest risk of getting it. Those with a weakened immune system, whether they have a chronic illness or some other sort of immune system disease or disorder. Time of year is a risk factor. We see it more frequently in the fall and the winter. Smoking, those who smoke are more likely to catch a cold, and when they do get a cold, it's often more severe. Then there's the question of exposure. How many people are you around? If you fly on airplanes or attend large event crowds, uh, large crowds, probably going to be exposed, and that increases your risk factors. The common cold, as we said, is this excessive mucus production. So we have an inflammatory response due to the invasion. This fluid drips down into the pharynx and into the esophagus and the lower respiratory tract, causing those cold symptoms. So that's where we get that sore throat, coughing, and sometimes an upset, upset stomach. Day one, we usually have a sore or scratchy throat, and you may or may not have a low-grade fever. Days two and three, patient's going to have some nasal obstruction or congestion, some rhinorrhea, and sneezing. Day four and five, the cough becomes bothersome. Now, because these colds are viral, that irritation that causes the, the mucosa to occur, triggering that sneeze reflex and reflex and triggering that cough, is the release of these inflammatory and vasoactive substances. So the average duration is about three to seven days. The problem is that sometimes the virus-inducing changes can cause airway reactivity, and that can persist for up to four weeks, particularly in the presence of the patient who has asthma or, again, a smoker or someone with COPD. So um, what you're going to find is that the most common complications of the common cold are the development of an acute sinusitis or an otitis. A secondary bacterial infection can occur if the common cold is not resolved, if it doesn't become a, um, if it becomes a problem and it's not self-limiting. So what is the treatment? Well, it involves the use of the antihistamines, the nasal decongestions, the antitussives, and sometimes the expectorants. Treatment is typically symptomatic, not curative, 
And the symptomatic treatment doesn't eliminate that causative pathogen because there are so many that it's really not effective for us to try to treat, to try to find out which one it is and to treat very specifically, particularly since our antivirals are more, broad, more broadly spectrum than that. It's very difficult to identify the virus, so that empiric therapy is what we use, and we treat those symptoms. Now, that's not to say that antivirals and antibiotics are not used. They may be used, but a definite viral or bacterial cause is usually not easily identified. So we reserve this for very specific cases. You're, we're familiar now with antibiotic stewardship, and so we want to be very careful that we don't create superbugs or other infections. And so we use this in specific cases when there are other problems that place the patient at higher risk for significant complications. So we'll start with talking about the antihistamines. The antihistamines are antihistamines. They're drugs that directly compete with histamine for specific receptor sites. We know that there are four histamine receptors. There's the H1 receptor, that's the one that's activated when we have allergic conditions and sleep disorders. That's the one that we see with these upper respiratory infections and these viral common cold symptoms. We have the H2 receptors. They're responsible for gastric acid, or they occur with gastric acid secretion. And then the H3 receptors we see mostly activated in uh, central nervous system disorders like narcolepsy, ADHD, Alzheimer's disease, there is some evidence that they can play a role in obesity, pain, and rhinitis, but the H4 receptors, this is our newest discovery of receptors, and they are involved with inflammatory conditions as well, including rhinitis, pruritus, and asthma, as well as inflammatory pain. So what about these antihistamine drugs? Well, we see the classifications, the histamine receptor blockers, we have the type 1. They're used to treat our allergic reactions. Our H2 receptor blockers, H3, and our H4. Today, we're primarily concerned with our H1 receptor blockers. These are the ones that we typically refer to as the antihistamines. Our cimetidine, ranitidine, these are the ones that you'll see uh, reducing gastric acid uh, secretion, and then our H3 receptor blockers treat our neurodegenerative conditions. And so we, um, when we talk about the common cold and these upper respiratory infections, we're not talking about the H2, H3, and H4 receptors, okay? So our antihistamines, our H1 antagonists are the ones that we refer to commonly as our antihistamines. So they have more than one property. They actually have an antihistaminic, an anticholinergic, and a sedative effect. And because of that, you'll find that these are often reused, used very reluctantly <laughs> or used with extreme caution in the geriatric population. We also don't want to use these in small children. And by that, I mean typically under the age of two. So our antihistamines are H1 antagonist. About 10 to 20% of the general population is sensitive to various environmental allergies. So they have some sort of a histamine mediated disorder. This could be an allergic rhinitis, anaphylaxis, angioneurotic edema, drug fevers. We could get insect bite reactions or urticaria. What they do is they block the action of the histamine at the H1 receptor sites. So they do compete with the histamine for binding at the unoccupied receptors, but they cannot push the histamine off of the receptor if it's already bound. So in their, in their use to relieve these allergic or non-allergic pruritic symptoms, um, then we can use them as an adjunct therapy. We use them only as an adjunct adjunct therapy and an anaphylactic reaction. So we are going to need to give that epinephrine. Your Benadryl is not going to work. It cannot push that histamine off the receptor if it's already bound. Many of our over-the-counter cold remedies contain antihistamines. So sometimes you'll hear controversy about the use of antihistamines in the treatment of cold symptoms. 
because it's best that they're used to treat allergic symptoms, but with the rhinorrhea and the coughing that occurs with the cold, sometimes patients will need to have an antihistamine. Decongestants, we'll talk about later, are the preferred way to treat these cold symptoms um, because of the swollen nasal membranes that can occur. So when we look at the antihistamines, that binding of the H1 blockers to the histamine receptors prevents this adverse consequence of the histamine stimulation. So we get decreased um, swelling. There's the vasodilation it isn't occurring, and the increased GIN respiratory secretions isn't occurring. We get an increase in capillary permeability. Um, they're generally not used to treat any of the lower respiratory tract symptoms, including asthma, because of the anticholinergic effects. So the anticholinergic effects can actually cause a thickening of the respiratory secretions and can impair the expectoration. So we have to be cautious, again, with our geriatric patients and those patients who may not have lung elasticity if we are going to use the antihistamines because of the potential for it to increase the viscosity of those secretions. So they are more effective in preventing the action of the histamine rather than reversing it. Because remember, it can't knock the histamine off of the receptor once it is on the receptor. So we have to give them early in treatment before all the histamine binds. Otherwise, it's just not going to be effective. So when we look at histamine versus antihistamine effects, excuse me, I flipped a little fast there. The, anti, the histamine um, cardiovascularly works on those small blood vessels. So it dilates and increases the permeability and allows the substances to leak into the tissues, which is where we get the increase in the mucus production. The antihistamine then reduces the dilation of the blood vessels and reduces that, that permeability with our smooth muscle or in the exocrine glands, the histamine stimulates the salivary, gastric, lacrimal, and bronchial secretions, whereas the antihistamine then reduces those secretions. Our histamine um, in the immune system releases the, uh, the release of substances that are commonly associated with allergic reactions occur. So the mast cells release this histamine and other substances that cause that allergic reaction, whereas the antihistamine then binds to those histamine receptors, prevents that histamine from latching on and causing a response. In the skin, you'll see that there is reduced capillary permeability. So you may get a feel and flare formation or itching that occurs. We'll see um, in the anticholinergic effect that occurs. That's our drying effect. So we get a reduction in the nasal salivary and lacrimal gland secretions. Our sedatives, um, the sedative effect, some of these can cause drowsiness. That's why if you pick up your Tylenol PM, right, you have acetaminophen and Benadryl or diphenhydramine. So because it is dose dependent, so if I take 25 milligrams of diphenhydramine for my allergic reaction and then I can't sleep, I could take 50 milligrams perhaps and it would put me to sleep because of the sedative effect. So often you'll find that, that the medication is dose dependent. So we're going to take a break here, come back, and we'll start with antihistamine indications. See you in a minute. 